Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you to be uh, to be with us. Um, I am Serene Serrano. I am the Engineer Sales and Marketing Managing Director uh, of Engineer. Uh, welcome on board. Welcome on this uh, Engineer Workshop. We are very pleased to welcome you in this uh, gymnasium. Uh, thanks for uh, Enaga Kamarimash to welcome uh, us here. <laughs> on, on stage today, uh, we will have uh, Dominique Rouchon uh, here, over there. He is the uh, organizer of this event. It's a big event for us. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. He will uh, ensure the coordination uh, today of this workshop. We have also in the room uh, Christophe Fromonté. Is it the, the Cinema Optic Director from Ingenieux? <laughs> he will add some uh, few words at the, at the end of this uh, workshop. Um, I would like to thank Randy Wedick uh, to be with us today. He is a Chief Technical Officer of uh, Bond Pro Film and Digital. He is also a cinematographer. Uh, thanks to be with us uh, today. He makes a long flight. He comes from Los Angeles, so thank you. We have also Arnaud Esbelin, who is a member of the Ingenie team. He is an Optimo Prime and Integrated Optical Palette uh, project manager. Uh, he will have the opportunity to uh, present you on the side uh, during the workshop, or we can uh, change the internal component to add creativity effect in the, in the lens. Um, thank you to be with us. During uh, this workshop, uh, you will have the opportunity to see a testimonial from uh, Checo Varese. He can't be with us today, but uh, he will give us a, a testimonial by a video. So it's good things. And I would like to, uh, um, to present you a special guest with us. He's um, Stephen Petitville, uh, Director yeah. of Photography, uh, <laughs> AFC, AFC member. Uh, Stephen uh, will give us his feedback on the last commercial where I used the Optimo Prime and uh, Integrated Optical Palette. And at the end, I would like to uh, thank Chris Fossett here. <laughs> the Steadicam operator. Uh, you have the chance to present you today the latest innovation of Ingenieux, the new uh, Optimo Ultra Compact Wide Angle. It is the first time we present in the world this product, so thank you. Uh, he will present this lens on the uh, Steadicam M2 with an uh, exo vest um, loaned by Tiffen, so thank you Tiffen for, for this loan. And I also, uh, to finish my introduction, uh, thanks Heliograph, the rental house uh, from here, who bring all the materials uh, on the set. Thank you very much for, uh, for your help. So let's start. I let the floor to, uh, to Randy and uh, with Dominique. Thank you very much. Microphone working. Hello. Hi. Um, so yeah, I've come out from Los Angeles. I work at BandPro. BandPro is a company that's been selling camera department equipment, just uh, lenses, camera bodies, tripods, monitors, that kind of thing for almost 40 years, and uh, recently we partnered with Ingenue and became their distribution service and uh, the, the, the entity Ingenue for North and South America. So um, I've had a lot of time to cooperate with them and also work on these uh, IOPs that go inside the lenses and that kind of thing. So um, this is an image of basically what we now have with the release of this new zoom lens we'll be showing at the uh, tail end of this presentation. Um, there is the Ultra 12 by, which is the kind of flagship zoom of all major productions that uh, need a zoom that covers you know, a vast range. And then you have Ultra Compact for something like, you know, when you want to fly in a steady cam or go handheld. And then also these Optimo Primes, which we have 12 focal lengths. We, have, we can um, show you them as well. And it's got kind of a prime lens compact zoom and a large zoom uh, unified family. They all have the same basic look. They, they all match more or less perfectly and it's a, it's a nice package to uh, go out with. Um, I'm going to talk about, so Optimo Primes, 
And usually when you hear ingenue, you're, you know, you're thinking about zoom lenses and, you know, I've got like, you know, you're thinking about these like cool filmmakers running around with zoom lenses or like uh, these 20 to 1 zooms they're using in Barry Lyndon um, or just, you know, you've seen a, a 12 by on like every big shoot you've been on, like, you know, Bill Bennett shooting a car commercial here. And um, we do have that, you know ultra 12 by, it's this massive lens. But there are also a history of Ingenue making primes. I'll show you, this is an Ingenue prime. Also an Ingenue prime, and these are like, you know, used in some pretty famous movies. Um, Touch of Evil is one that you can think of. And these are like, you know, vintage, vintage primes. This record store scene in Clockwork Orange. But these are, now I'm gonna talk to you about these, the modern lenses here. So. What the Optimo Prime does is it basically takes this, you know, all the characteristics of this gorgeous Optimo lens, the 12 by, that's this massive tank, and it has a very special way to render color and light and detail, and shrinks it down into something that, you know, you can run around with uh, really easily. I'm wearing the same shirt today. That's funny. Um, so here's an Optimo Prime, and I'm just sort of going to talk to you about what, mm, like, the idea behind it is. And um, we have two sets here, and one of them is basically this: these sets and this camera on this side are lenses that have the factory look installed in them, and then. These lenses and this camera over here and this monitor will be showing modified lenses. So the, the lenses are designed to be modified and I'm gonna go over how that works. Um, so kind of the, one of the secret recipes of Ingenue is that the image quality is designed in a certain way in which it, it favors a lot of resolution, but at the same time, it renders it in a low contrast way. So that's like a pretty sophisticated topic, but basically it allows you to kind of record really excellent detail, but not overload these digital sensors with too much detail. Also the lower contrast look allows for some really interesting flares, and it kind of allows you to squeeze a little bit more dynamic range into a digital imager. The other thing that is really well known about these is that the Optimo family is really well known for its color and it has a, like a very true color reproduction that feeds excellent color information into your sensor, onto your piece of film, whatever. And then this fourth point here I have is it's, it's beautiful skin tone rendition. This is really just a side effect of one, two, and three, or A, B, and C here. High resolution, low contrast, true color reproduction. If you add those up, you're going to end up getting beautiful skin tone rendition because you're gonna have the ability to get all of the various tones, translucencies, the, the warms, the cools, all of that from somebody's face. And it's gonna be presented in a detailed way, but it's not going to be overly so. Um, one of the things you get when you shrink a massive zoom lens down to a prime is you can focus on just one focal length. So the geometry of these lenses from the 18 up to the 200, the geometry is very well corrected on all these. They, they're, they're very uh, interesting looking because they're like the 18 on a full frame, that's like a 12 millimeter on a Super 35. It's a pretty wide lens, but you can put someone in the middle of the picture and they look normal, and, but then when you start moving it, you get a lot more extra motion and you get like, kind of like a, a lot of the effects of a wide lens but without the distortion that you would imagine in some of these things. So it's, it's the geometry is really excellent and then Ingenue has a history of like, really innovating coatings for not necessarily purely technical means, but also for beauty. So they have um, 
and this is tied into this low contrast look. So the, the flares are designed in a way that they look cool, you know, and they look interesting. They're, they're cinematic. They get some white wash. You get some rainbow flares. You get, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, mechanically speaking, you get really, you know, high precision lens. Most of these lenses are under two kilograms. All of them except the 200 millimeter or 95 millimeter front ring. So they're designed to be like a one-handed lens that you can do an easy lens change with. It's not like an enormous um, full-frame lens like some of the other ones out there. So it's quite small. Um, it's the size of, you know, like many, many Super 35 lenses. All of the lenses have identical ring spacing. Some of them are longer. Um, but the iris and focus rings are in the same place, so when you want to do a quick swap, you don't have to move your motors around or anything. Uh, they all have a 320-degree focus throw, which is a good amount of precision for when you're pulling focus. A PL mount, and they cover full-frame VistaVision. I recently did a projection test and found that I wouldn't say they exactly cover the Alexa 65, but they will make an, almost all of them will make an image out to the edge of the sensor on that, which is pretty interesting. Um, it's not exactly like a flat field image, but it does cover. They also include the uh, slash I metadata encoding in the PL mount contacts, as well as with the four pin Limo connector if you need to feed out to like a virtual set encoder or something like that, special effects vendor. Um, and, and, they also have this IOP. And the IOP is an integrated optical palette. So what this means is um, you have the ability to go into the lens in a clean environment with a lens tech during a prep, not like on a, you know, school gymnasium, but we're gonna do it anyways. Um, and you can open up the lens and go inside and take out optics and put other ones in, and they have different effects. The reason behind this is so that you don't have to buy a set of master primes and decode them, or you don't have to like go hunt down vintage lenses that have this one specific look, and then you you know, or and get them rehoused and wait two years to get them rehoused, or, you know, um, buy a normal set of lenses that have this one crazy flair to them and hope that that, like, stays profitable for many years. You get the ability to kind of open up the lens, change the personality, put it on the job, take it off the job, put the glass back in from the factory, and then go put it on a, another different kind of job. And you're able to modify these lenses. And then also, as a DP, you're able to experiment with these things and kind of create your own personal look. And obviously, this has been popular with a couple of different major rental house empire type vendors that are, make their own lenses. And, you know, they can make a lens for somebody, or they can make a lens for a certain job, a certain movie. But a lot of rental houses don't have that ability, and they would like the ability to have a beautiful, super high-end lens that they can then customize and then return to its original look. So that is the integrated optical palette is. And you know, it's a palette. It's Ingenue is a French company, and painting, and French Impressionism, and all that. So this is um, kind of a rendered view of what's, what goes on, but uh, at the end of this presentation, um, after all of it, I'm gonna tr I'm gonna have everyone come down, and we can like screw around with the cameras and shoot and try different lenses and get your hands on it. And also during that time period, um, our no is gonna be over at this desk here. If we have any lens techs or any real like lens savvy. Uh, people that are interested in the mechanics and the optics of it, we're going to disassemble the lens and um, take all the pieces out and show you that uh, it's not incredibly difficult. The design of this lens basically is that the most of the lens is in a single 
like glued together optical block that you can unscrew and pull out. And then below that, you have these rings here that are in this image. So it's not like tearing down an, you know, an, a, a lens that's not supposed to be done this way. The lens is designed to, to be uh, disassembled, reassembled many times over the course of its existence, and it's made to be in kind of an easy way. I mean, we can do it in less than 10 minutes. Um, but it's not something I recommend doing on set, like I said, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, we at, at BanPro, I, I've said this before, we do this in a clean room, which is like a kind of a place where you'd assemble a circuit board or something like that, but you don't need to do that. I would just say just do it in a clean room, you know, just like a, maybe a hotel room or something, or a prep bay, a, uh, a lens tech area that's clean, that kind of thing. But uh, this is not something that I really recommend that you do on like a, you know, outside here on like a windy day. It would be bad, I think. Um, so here's an image, a cutaway image of the lens. And there's three dots on there. There's a red dot, a green dot, and a yellow dot. And these are the three different points of customization in this lens. This um, area in the middle here, this is what's called the internal IOP. And um, this is the center position in the lens. This is where if you really want to have the most interesting optical effects happen, this is where you would put a different piece of glass. A reflective piece, a diffusive piece, that kind of thing. Um, behind that, immediately, like less than a millimeter behind that, is the iris cartridge. This is removable as well with the same tool. And this allows you to um, adjust the shape of your bokeh and uh, also kind of experiment with different um, shapes of irises if you want to mimic like an, a B-speed lens with a triangular iris or like a, an anamorphic-ish lens with an oval iris, that kind of thing. Um, this is a, it's an easy thing to pop in and out. Behind all that is a quick release slot on the rear and this allows you to uh, on set very easily swap an additional effect in on top of that. So I will kind of go into this a little more. The center position is interesting because it's really like dead set in the middle of the lens. And um, this is what they refer to as the afocal area in this lens. And one of the reasons why you want to put a filter here is that all of the light rays are collected here regardless of the focal length. So it's like 18, 25, 40, 100, 200. All the light beams are all basically the same size. So you can put a piece of diffusion in here and it will be the same regardless of the focal length. You won't have to change out a certain strength for an 18 and then, oh, we're going to 135, get a different filter. All the filters, because you're putting it in the center, all the filtration effects will be identical regardless of the focal length, which is kind of cool. Um, also, this light is trapped inside the barrel. It's basically like, instead of having it in a matte box or behind the lens, when you have it inside the middle of the lens um, and you have something reflective, like we have some filters where we strip the coatings off and they're very reflective. Um, what you get is you get a lot of light that bounces around inside the lens and it's not gonna go out the front element or the back, it's going to bounce off all the other elements and kind of project itself as a, it's an interesting flare. It's, when you have it in the middle, it's going to create a flare like it is the lens, as opposed to this is just a filter in a matte box. It's gonna be bouncing around and, and it, it kind of creates something that is much more akin to the look of like a vintage lens or something like that. So it's very interesting to have it in the back, I mean in, in the middle here. Um, yeah, because the, the reflections bounce around many directions. If you have a diffusive element, um, like I said, it's this, light rays cross over here and the, uh, the diffusion is totally consistent regardless of your focal length. 
And the other reason that it's cool in the afocal region is that uh, you can put filtration in here, and because the light rays are out of focus, it will reduce the amount of dot patterns that you'll see. So a lot of times when you see pretty heavy diffusion on something, and then someone walks into a close-up, and you have Christmas lights or something like that behind you, you can see the actual engraved micro pattern from diffusion filters. You can see them in the lighting behind you as you roll the focus. And um, this is a, um, a way to minimize that. I won't say it completely eliminates it, but if, on the lower strengths, it, it, it makes it totally invisible. If you have it on the rear filter, or if you put something in the matte box, it's closer to the focused image, so you're gonna see a little more of the printing in if you have it in the rear or if you have it in the, uh, like a flat uh, filter in the front. So here's some test images. Um, we've shot tons and tons of tests and um, put a lot of uh, lenses out on shows. And um, this is from a test that I shot uh, showing some black satin here, but we're gonna go in depth into each of these filters. Um, I'm gonna kinda bust through that and then uh, show you guys uh, what the filters look like versus an unfiltered factory image and then a customized image on this monitor. So we're going to kind of go back and forth on that. Um, here are some different images. So behind that is uh, the iris cartridge. And um, this is something that uh, we've experimented with a little bit. And um, it's, we created a triangular iris that is similar to like an old Zeiss B speed or like, uh, you know, other uh, earlier type lenses. Um, you can create a bunch of different shapes depending on what stop you're at. Um, this is something I'm not entirely proud of <laughs> that we did for like a, a massive reality show in America that they, they bought a lot of equipment from us and they asked us to make this in the 3D printer and I was really embarrassed but we made it and they loved it and uh, it's, it's on Netflix and, and it's... We thought it was for Valentine's Day. It's, Victoria's you know, Secret and it's or... just, it's, it celebrates love in general. <laughs> but this is something you can do, you know, you can make 3D printed stuff and throw it in there, it's kind of corny but um, I'm going to immediately scroll past that image. But, um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. Um, and then the rear palette is something that is basically you can screw on and screw off in 15 seconds. So that's akin to something that you can adjust. And what I found people doing is they, they settle on a look that they like in the center position and then they can throw a modifier on the back. And um, a lot of times what I've seen people do is they take like a, um, like stockings or like a, like a, like a fagal or something like that and put that on to a mounted holder and then they could just click, 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 click. Cause it takes a long time to like get that like snot tape and the fagal and all that stuff. Like it takes a long time to get that ready. But with these holders, you can um, just unscrew one and pop it on, keep it ready for the whole set. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, the rear palette, also, the light rays are further apart now. And um, because of that, uh, okay, yes, so this is interesting. Um, kind of jumping to the side here, but the internal IOP, because of the, the, where the light rays are, I, I would say it's about twice as strong, or I would say the rear filter is about half as strong, but it really depends what's interesting because this palette is inside the lens, is inside this tube, it's really dependent on how much you backlight it. It's like, it's not super consistent. If you're really like panning across an image and you hit a light here, you're going to get a, a ton more effect off of the center and the rear filter because of their kind of enclosed in these tubes. You know, they're not like out in front of the lens. But in general, I would say that the internal IOPs are about double the strength of the rear. Um, but okay, so back to this discussion about size and shape. The 
orientation as you get to the back of the lens. The light rays are separated. You have up, down, left, right. It's obviously inverted, but what you can do here is you can have an effect that has more of an effect in the center than on the edge. You know, you can do some style like uh, vignetting, or you can do, um, there is something that we have here called a vintage filter, which is sort of a loaded phrase, but um, it is a, an optic that is thicker in the center than it is towards the edges. And what that would do is that will um, create a variation in the focal plane. And that allows you to kind of put an image in focus in the center, and then it slowly drifts off to the edge. And that's something that's like really desirable in older lenses with less geometry correction, less aspheric elements, older designs. People like a lot of this field curvature. Um, it's a fun thing to play around with, and uh, we have some, some stuff that, that uh, Stephen shot with that. Um, and also, yeah, like I said here, it's a quick swap, and it is also can be a modifier. Uh, the third thing I have in here is it only affects the outgoing rays. This is sort of something I'm trying to dig into right now, but like this is an example of an internal filter. You see that the images, the flare is completely covering more than the sensor. And then uh, with the rear filters, there's like, the way it's going out the back of the lens, it seems to kind of shape some of these uh, light flare clouds and stuff. So there's a little, it's kind of like nitpicking, but I mean, when am I gonna find another audience that is as nitpicky as this, right? Like you guys are the right people to talk to about this. But there's a different shape to the light that comes out of the rear filter, and I can show you guys that um, when we do the live demo. Um, ingenue primes were used to photograph the whale, which is being shown here. Um, and uh, I, have, I have not seen too much from this movie, but I hear it's very good. And um, you know, I have a lot of respect for Maddie. And um, also, there's another show coming out on Prime called Daisy Jones and the Six. This is done by Check Over Essay, um, the DP. He um, he and I worked on, I, I stopped by his test, and he had a, like literally the biggest lens and look test I've ever seen for a television show. It was like a stage four times the size with full built sets, live rigged lights, like a rock and roll stage with 50 park hands on it, dolly with a crane, remote head, all the operators, 15 person G&E team, sound, the whole thing. And they had 16 sets of lenses out. And they had every single thing you could get, basically, you know, all the vintage stuff, all the latest stuff. And we went through it piece by piece. And then uh, he was really curious about these Optima Primes. And we put those on and we played around with some different looks. And then he ended up settling on glimmer glass. Um, for the show. And we did a lot of tests with this like rock and roll stage and it's backlit, tons of park hands and dimmer board and you know, they're all firing and you get a lot of really interesting flares with the glimmer glass. But then they, we would do more low contrast work. We would do just like an apartment with like a overhead soft light and maybe a little kick or something. And that wasn't quite enough then. So he was like, you know, what can we do? Can we add a net or something? And this is where that idea of like getting the entire rear baffle, getting additional ones of those, wrapping them with nets, and then keeping them in a box. And if you want to go, okay, I have glimmer glass, I want to add a net, it just open up the box, put the net on, put the lens back in, you're good to go. So the ability to kind of take a look, and then modify it, and then additionally modify it, I guess, of course, with front filters and lighting and all that. It's kind of interesting, and um, it was cool to see. This is sort of a, like a classic rock 70s story that bears a lot of resemblance to the story of Fleetwood Mac. And um, so they have a lot of rock concert stuff, but they also have a lot of like warm 70s type of lighting in it as well. 
Um, so I'm going to show now some examples of the IOP. And um, I'm going to get our wonderful models in here. I'll get yep. you guys on the you guys on the cameras. And um, we're going to go through a couple of different examples here. So one of the things I'm going to show you guys is over on this monitor, it's going to be a unmodified lens. So this is what we call neutral glass. It's basically the exact same glass that is used in the rest of the lens with anti-reflection coating on both sides. And um, this is the normal look of the lens. And then over here on the right side for all of these, I'm going to show you um, a modified lens. And this is all we're doing here is we're taking out one piece of glass in the middle of the lens and replacing it with just like sort of an uncoated piece of glass. And it, it creates like a ton more um, interesting flaring effects, a lot of colors, that kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting that just one modification, changing out one piece of glass with two surfaces on it, front and the back, that don't have um, flare coatings, will create such a uh, personality to this. I could go a along pretty deeply into all these, but after some discussion, I realized that it would be a lot more interesting if I kind of went through each of these and then would have you people in the audience come down and, and operate the cameras and use them. So I'm not gonna go like, I'm not gonna spend like 15 minutes on each optic. But what I will say is that the uncoated, um, I've done a lot of tests on it and uh, it adds a lot. It takes the normal image that you're getting here and then it adds a ton of flare and glare, but it does no diffusion and it, it add, adds, I mean, it adds no softness to the image, but it adds a lot of interesting colored veil and, and um, it picks up a lot of extra light from the environment. And it's a very simple change. And I, for me, it's kind of become my favorite um, that it, because it keeps so much of the beautiful personality of the ingenue lens, but it adds this kind of, you know, really, really cool look. And like I said, this is like, 10 minutes per lens. So like if you're doing a checkout and you like this and you have the, you know, there's the time for it, you can get this done in a couple hours and um, get the whole set set up this way. Yeah. Here in the, uh, the, uh, the IOP is installed on the 18 millimeters, right? Right, okay. yeah. So yeah, we've got, um, on this side, this is the, the one with the uh, uncoated, and this is with the coated lens here. So, I mean, they're pretty similar geometry lenses. Can I have you come a little closer? Actually. So we have two Sony Venices? Yeah, so these are both Venice twos. Um, they're shooting at 800 ISO. They have a one stop of ND in there, and we're shooting it at two. And we're gonna shoot it at two, basically, throughout the entire thing. The, the lenses open up to a 1.8. I can open up to a 1.8 as well. Um, but it's, so you'll see like the personality of this lens, it does have some cool veiling glare here and we can generate some, I can use like a flashlight, we can generate some really interesting colored flares and stuff. As it is, the lens is smoking. Like it, it looks exactly like a ultra 12 by, but instead of being a full frame lens, that's a 4.2 or the zoom lens being a 2.9. It's a, a 1.8 lens that's very small and can fit in a you know, very, very mobile package. Um, and on this screen? So yeah. We have, this is where we have the IOP encoded, Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm gonna, gonna, can you just kind of just pan around with this right side camera and just open up some flares and kind of just discover some, like do some, do some panning and tilting on this one. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can do it as well. Okay. Yeah. You'll see, yeah, exactly. And then just kind of open this up here to 
to tilt it. Just kind of, you know, move around and you'll see that you can, as soon as we hit this other flary light here, you know, we pick up so much more flare, but when we're not doing that, the lens doesn't look that different. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to um, jump to the next one here. So that is uh, Black Pro Mist. So do you guys want to um, get those 24 millimeter lenses up? And I got some, uh, there's a lot of, if you go to Band Pro Film and Digital on Vimeo, we've shot tons and tons and tons of test material for this that you guys can check out as kind of a library of all the different looks. And we've even done shoots that are like pretty big shoots that we do the same exact moving shot over and over with the same lighting cue and all that stuff. And uh, we're changing out the different filters. Here, um, we're going to put on the black pro mist, and this is kind of, um, I mean, you know, everyone pretty much is familiar with the black pro mist, but yeah, putting it on the inside is really interesting. Um, it adds some halation, and it's kind of sort of like a, some people have, not really my words, but people have really convinced me of this, that it's like kind of a, like a gritty type of diffusion that, you know, if you're like, looking for like a science fiction movie or a western or something, it, it could be a really good pick for that. So now the lenses are on. Yeah, so we have two, 24 millimeters here, and on the left here, where we have a uh, default lens here with a neutral glass. This is with the black pearl mist. And then um, maybe I can pan this light over. You want to play around with that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can you show us the same, uh, the same uh, frame to compar for comparison of mm -hmm. those? Like, like, they're sure. very similar because those, those are two just... Pretty different uh, angles. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when we're done with this, definitely. Uh -huh. I'm d I mean, let's, let's do that, like, uh, I'm immediately after this demo. But, like, kind of for the purposes of this demo, I... I'm gonna just keep moving until I get through all this stuff. But like, let's let's like the, more of the whole point of this camera mod experience is like everyone here is they're not like uh, I mean you're all crew people you know like we should use the gear so like we'll we'll get to that um, for sure yeah, get we'll to the bottom that. of it yeah yeah but I mean let's see so. This is just like a, a, a going to be like a taste of what these filters do, and then you know we can kind of move move the actors around. We've got this uh, really nice lighting crew here. We can change the dimmer board out, all that stuff. So um, I'm going to keep moving forward though. Um, black satin, which is going to be on the uh, 21. 21. Okay, yeah. please, gentlemen. And so black satin. This is like kind of um, really. It's a, it's a very like luxurious kind of silky diffusion, and this isn't necessarily just like these are things that we developed in collaboration with Tiffin, but what I find is that they're not exactly they don't look like a front matte box filter when you have it inside the lens and you're lighting it a certain way they pick up a lot more extra personality. Um, one of the things that's really cool about this is that it's not limited to just like what's in our sales sheet. There's a lot of ability to kind of get creative with this, work with rental houses, work with optics manufacturers, work with other vendors and that, and kind of create your own looks that other people or other rental houses or other DPs don't have because you've kind of like built it up on your own. And that's something that um, we're really behind here. We really, um, we really believe in. Okay. Lens you guys are on. On the 21? Okay. 
Yeah, so let's see here if I can. Yeah, let's see if I can find something that is similar here. But in this one, yeah, so the black satin, we'll go back to it, but black satin, also what I found was really cool. I don't know if this is going to have a huge impact commercially, but when I desaturated the image to black and white, um, black satin looks like almost exactly like the flaring you'd get on like a super Baltar or like a older 50s era lens. It has like a, a really cool silky halation, but I could also, you know, see this... And, Bear in mind, these are all one-eighth strengths. Like, this is quite turned down. Um, and it's still uh, it's very interesting looking. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say, like, this is the one that has probably the most softening and the heaviest blooming and the flares. And, you know, you could, uh, could find a use for this, I think. Um, after that, Glimmer Glass is probably, I would say, the most commercially successful. This is going to be on the 50. We're going to do a little kind of a relight to more of a low contrast look and kind of change the blocking a little bit. So I'm going to talk for a little bit. But um, Glimmer Glass is kind of far and away the most commercially successful thing we've had. We've sold probably four times the amount of Glimmer Glasses we've sold of the other IOPs. And there's something about it that's like, it has a lot of the features of all these other different filters, but it's a little more subtle. And one of the things that Glimmer Glass does is it picks up a lot of color and a lot of um, off-axis lighting and RGB lighting. It'll, it picks up a ton of color and washes it over the scene. And um, that's really... Um, pretty interesting and it's also like not very over the top in terms of its flares. It's a lot, it's a more controlled flare. But the part about it picking up more light on the, uh, picking up more color on the set is something, I don't know how it does it, but it's very interesting. Um, and I'm going to have a, uh, a video testimonial here from uh, Checo Varese. He is on set, he's shooting a new show and it's also on Optima Primes, so he's, um, he's pretty into it. Um, this is his second show in a row shooting on Optima Primes. Good evening. Sorry I cannot be there. Sorry I cannot be there with you guys. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with all my friends that are looking at me and saying, what are you doing? Um, we're shooting a show called Under the Bridge. It's based on a true story a tragic true story that happened a few years ago, that's as much as I can tell you. We did some tests today, not that I travel all around the world with lights and backdrops and camera, we just happened to be doing a test today, and um, uh, we chose the engineer primes. Um, we're gonna use an internal filter for some scenes. Uh, it will be the glimmer glass, and uh, I love the way these lenses sort of envelop the characters. And I do believe lenses are, lenses are animated things. You know, lenses are alive. If, if you ask a lens to do something, the lens is not happy, you will know right away. If the lens is not happy at a two, you will know right away. So there is a dialogue between a cinematographer and a lens that comes from understanding what the lens wants and what you want from the lens. Most of the time it's a love story. Sometimes it's not a love story. And uh, I think the engineers have this sort of bubbly quality of sparkling champagne. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's how you do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I love Chaco. He's a funny guy. Uh, Locon is something we have here. Oh wait, we're gonna look at the glimmer glass, yeah. Good. So, I will uh, go back to the glimmer. There we go. So yeah, these, this is the, the glimmer on some 50 millimeters here. Um, let's get this Astera in the middle, maybe, and uh, see if we can pop a little bit. Now the thing about the glimmer is that it is pretty subtle. Maybe we can 
crank up some stuff, but let's see if we can kind of see the difference here. Yeah, well, you see, if you look at this on the left here, you can see that the, uh, the coatings on the Ingenue are totally holding this colored over exposure here, and it's giving you a little pleasant um, flare over here. And I think like a lot of the reason why this filter is so popular is that it's like, it's not hammering you over the head. It's like it's a, it's like the the exact lens that you like, only a little nicer. So, um, you know, that's that's I I I don't know why, but um, people love the glimmer glass, and um, I'm uh, I'm happy to. Uh, and we also have I think we have it on a 200 millimeter. Um, if you guys want to demo that as well too afterwards, um, I'm gonna just sort of kind of hunt around the set here and see if we can find anything else that's a little more interesting. But, yeah, so I mean, you're getting a little bit of this like um, kind of circular flare in the middle there, and you're getting a lot of this um, kind of halation around those uh, LED rings on the wall. And then um, I have this like, Awesome flashlight, Amazon special here. And um, you can use this to pick up a lot of interesting, uh, like if you have like moving shots and you have like kind of, a, you know, interesting lighting rigs and stuff as you walk through things, this thing really tends to um, pop color. I don't really know why. I don't know enough about the glimmer glass, but um, it's pretty interesting that it, for some reason it seems to pick up little more of the uh, the colored lighting and we can play around with that in the the live demo portion of the day here um, I think we're gonna go to low cone which is 75 right so low contrast so yeah we're gonna go to a 75 mil and uh, show you some of that. Low con is, is a pretty subtle filter, especially in a one eighth strength. So we're developing a quarter strength as well for it now. And um, basically all it's going to do is just very subtly kind of raise up the black level. Um, I can have you guys sit there for a little bit, but also um, later I'm gonna have you stand up in this shot. But um, it basically just gives you a subtle lift on all of your shadow region. Allows you to kind of reach further into the um, shadow region. And then another weird thing that I kind of don't know why happens again is that the low con is very good at picking up these sort of like rainbow rings when you hit it a certain way. And um, that's a lot of fun too. And this is another uh, filter that I also have in a rear filter. So it's kind of like an additional subtle effect, but you're like, oh, I, I like what I'm doing with the glimmer glass, but I want to lower the contrast a little bit. You could clip a, a uh, low con on the back and kind of multiply the two effects together, which is interesting. You guys good? All set. Okay. For. I think, like I said, this low con one eighth is pretty subtle, and maybe we'll have to have them stand up. I think it's better if they stand. If you guys stand and kind of um, like along this yellow line here, and wait, you guys, um, Peter, can you help me out with this operating here, real quick? No, it's cool, it's fine. I just want to get like a, a low angle shot here. I think, I think I was playing around with this, but it's also some of these like consumer grade monitors that were on here. But um, I'd have to play around with this a little bit more to get this to really sing, but um, perhaps playing around with the rear filter uh, later I can show you this. But it, this, did, this does, um, very subtly raise this, but I think it's a, something that's a little easier to see on like a reference monitor. Um, but I'm gonna see if I can pop these uh, 
rainbow flares, which I, I've, I've found to be pretty weird and interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you can see it on the left side of that image, but there's something, and it depends on like how focused the light beam is and all that, but um, there's some really interesting stuff you can do with that. Um, I think we can maybe use one of these orbiters or something to pop that as well. And yeah, like I said, like the uncoded, what's interesting about this low con is that it has no, it doesn't diffuse the image whatsoever as well. So if you're looking for a sharp image, but you want to adjust some of the characteristics of it, this low con does it in kind of a non-destructive manner. Uh, there's a net M here that is made by Ingenue. It's a beautiful filter. Um, and that's on the 135. So let's pop that on there. And um, this is a pretty strong effect. It's pretty cool. Um, it uh, probably is the strongest of the effects. And uh, it's a, like a, an actual, very, very similar to an a actual stocking filter. And it adds kind of some texture to the image. Um, and I'll see if we can look at it here. So you guys can take a seat again here. I think we're a little too close for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on the left again is the neutral glass image. On the right is with the uh, net filter. So already you can see that there's like kind of these uh, directional flares that pop off of here. And um, yeah, if you want to just sort of glide over, well, you just hold it, hold it right there for a second. You can kind of see that there's these directional patterns coming off, and then I'm going to um, kind of hunt around the set and see if I can find a little bit more. So you see, you get you get these kind of interesting kind of like diffraction grating flares um, that you won't get on the unmodified lens, and. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty sophisticated if you get the right lighting setup and the right content for it. Yeah, sometimes it'll blend into the background and other times when you're hitting it with a, like a stronger backlight, like maybe over here. you get this very, like these strong arched fixed patterns off of lights. Um, like behind her head there, this is kind of cool. And depends on how the, uh, where the focus point is and where the light is, you can kind of adjust these uh, 70s looking beams in the back there. The other thing we have is a rear filter. Don't have a lot of rear filters to show you, but I'm going to show you this one. This is uh, on the 100 millimeter. And um, in lieu of showing you my demo footage, we're going to show you Steven's footage here from his Amex commercial. And then I've got a bunch of stills and video clips that we can kind of walk through quickly. <laughs> KLM American Express Gold. Gagnez des miles au quotidien. Utilisez-les pour rêver plus loin. So, Stephen, uh, you want to come on up? Please welcome Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Pettyville. Thanks, Rindo. Yeah. Hi. 
Yeah, yeah. So St Stephen's an AFC member, and um, he's uh, recently used the Optima Primes and used the Vintage Rear, and he kind of created some uh, like extra fall off and kind of bokeh texture. We were kind of talking about it at that party last night. So yeah. I've got some still images here and some great, video clips great. he provided me. Maybe you can give it a whirl. Okay. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, so yeah, when we started this to, to think about this commercial, uh, we had several constraints. Like we, we knew already that working with the little girl, we will have to be moving around. So everything has to be on the gimbal and being reactive and not really handheld, but still moving around. So we needed basically short lenses, light, lightweight that we can mount on a gimbal, and also having a really good close focus, because most of everything we were like chasing her a little bit, which I hope we don't see too much. But <laughs> um, And in the other hand, that's all of the need of the modern lenses that we needed, but also wanted a look that was a little more like round and giving some fall-offs and stuff like that. So I've heard about and being really happy that the, the IOP was available and just arrived in Belgium where we shoot. So we tried a couple and, uh, and I ended up with the Vintage Rare, with, which basically gives, if you look on, up on there, yeah. those bokeh in the, in the back, that's one of the main things that you can notice, it gives a texture. So it's not only giving the fall off, but it also gives a texture to the lights in the background. And when you move around with the focus, yeah. if you get one of these outtakes, maybe yeah. it speaks a little more. Yeah. But yeah they, this is also because of the construction of this filter is like a bunch of pieces of glass glued on top of each other. So you're kind of seeing that, that imagery there. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys? <laughs> can you guys kill these two side lights? Uh, can you can you get these the, the two high ones? Just just these guys, right? Quick, this one. Yeah, we're just and then maybe also this one. We'll take this one. Let's get more intimate. <laughs> So yeah, so you can tell on the side all those bokeh gets, yeah. and the shape is changing a little bit, and the texture is adding. Um, yeah, and as you move the camera, yeah, the, yeah. it changes as well. Yeah, yeah. And um, you want me to show some of this video? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, is this video? Uh, yeah, probably. It's beautiful so you can stuff. See when it's. Coming in the closer we go. Yeah. Getting in and out. Yeah, you can kind of see it there too. Uh, yeah. And, uh, this one too. Mm. How long did this shoot go for? Mm -hmm. How many days is this shoot? Uh, that was two days. Yeah. And then you were so saying you felt like you. It picked up some more warmth as well, yeah, possibly. Yeah. So yeah, so those bokeh are the main ones and the one you can notice the most. But while we were like side by side, and you probably yeah. gonna <laughs> love to test it afterwards. Yeah. But um, that gives the whole fall off on the sides of the um, of the lens, and all the sides get a little little more of what you expect from the vintage lenses that we're chasing all the time. Right. But in the other hand, once again. We need to rely on the it's like on a the lens modern and the, yeah. mechanical lens. It's going to hit its marks every time, and you it's not going to fall apart. You go through a whole, sh whole shoot yeah. without having to uh, fix anything. So. Right. I know they all color match and yeah. they're modern, but they yeah. have the a lot of the characteristics that you're yeah. looking for. But the housing and the mechanics yeah. and the optics are like 2022, 2023. Right. But then you're like, you know, you put in some. You know, yeah. and I would have the close focus as well. Yes, the, the, the yeah. whole the whole set is super close focus and yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, I mean, there really it's, nice. it's it's it's. I wouldn't quite say it's a macro, but they, you can get some really you know some some you can get right up in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. Um, I'm gonna have Sebastian come on in a second here, but sure. um, cool. 
thanks for yeah. coming by. And Thank then if you. you guys have any questions about using them on a shoot, you know, Stephen has, has got firsthand experience yeah. and he's, he's, a, he's a great, great guy to talk to. Um, we're gonna, gonna have uh, Sebastian. Sebastian come up here. Yeah, Seb Sebastian is uh, it's a, it's a guy that we've been working with recently, and he's he's like a, he's gone through optical design program and uh, I think film school as well. Right. And uh, he we've kind of like been drafting him to kind of come up with some very original IOPs or maybe or sort of like. I won't say the mass-produced version, but kind of making things by hand and kind of, you know, like uh, creating their own, creating your own IOPs. Like you would just get a piece of glass and like scratch certain patterns in it, or like in this case, we've got something with some plastic wrap on it. Or so. Anyways, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you talk about it though. Yeah. But this is. Uh, Please welcome Sebastian. Yeah, Sebastian does a let's say. Hello, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Sebastian, that's me. Um, I've just been graduated from the famous film school in Paris last June. And before, um, I was an engineer, an optical engineer. And um, I have been graduated from the Optical Institute in Paris-Saclay, which is, believe it or not, uh, the school where Pierre Ingenieux himself studied. So Pierre Ingenieux is the founder yeah. of Ingenieux. So as a former engineer and um, as a cinematographer, I can see how these uh, lenses uh, can be very interesting in an optical point of view, but also in a cinematographic point of view. Um, to be honest, uh, I have shot with uh, some short films with uh, ingenue uh, lenses, but uh, I have never shot uh, movies uh, with uh, Optimo Prime yet. Uh, but uh, I had the opportunity to make some tests, many tests uh, in my school, my film school, and uh, while uh, preparing uh, next uh, movies uh, in, uh, in a few months. So, we talked about uh, their uh, very interesting uh, optical qualities, like uh, low contrast, uh, great resolution, and, uh, great uh, restitution of colors. But um, at a lower scale, as a student or as a, a young DP starting his career, which is my scale and probably the scale of many of you, there is um, another question which is very important. Um, are these lens practical? And uh, is it comfortable to shoot movies with them when you are part of a small team or uh, when you don't have a big budget uh, and uh, a low budget? And um, I think uh, we can say yes. Uh, they combine very good optical qualities with, um, um, sorry, versatility and also um, a really good capacity. It's uh, very compact, they are very compact and uh, they are easily held in hand. They are not too heavy and I think it's very interesting when uh, you have to, to shoot quickly because you have many, many shots to do uh, uh, in a day. So it's a good point. Uh, same if you have to hold by hand uh, the camera or if you have to put the camera on a ring. Uh, i give you an example. For example, uh, last year, I have to shoot a movie and uh, for this movie, I had to put uh, the camera on a car uh, camera mount and uh, we didn't have the budget to have a very sophisticated uh, mount and uh, we didn't have uh, the Ingenieur Optimo Primes because they weren't uh, available at this time. So uh, we, we shoot with very, very, very good optics from uh, another company, very good optics. Uh, but the problem was that they were very heavy, very big, and uh, frankly, uh, 
I think that if it was possible, no, I'm not, I don't think, I'm sure that uh, if it was possible, I would have shot uh, the movie with uh, these um, lenses. Uh, moreover, they are very, very good uh, close focus, and it was a very important issue uh, for, uh, for the scene. So, yes, I yeah. think it's very interesting. Yeah, so we, ha we have a, a, like a lens that has been customized, yes, but not exactly. from a factory. This is the, basically an IOP yeah, that we've exactly. taken, and we've taken a piece of like a plastic wrap or cling film and wrapped it yeah, over it exactly. and then put that inside. You know, and we'd, there's a lot of different stuff that people have been doing, gluing Swarovski crystals on with optical glue or like uh, scratching certain patterns or even people contracting optical companies, building uh, bespoke solutions for, you know, rental house, like this is, goes from anywhere from like, you know, a very like sort of art school approach of like, we just took a piece of glass and scratched it all the way up to rental houses, developing their own glass and contracting other glass manufacturers, coating manufacturers to create custom filters that no one else can have. But you know, it, it also goes back down to this level of, oh, I just took this $50, you know, yeah. filter out of the lens and we, we you know, made yeah, our own exactly. custom look on it. And, you know, this is, this is like that exact filter I was talking about. And maybe you can see here, but like we've really managed to, you know, distort the shape of the, uh, the flares in the shot, but it hasn't really like ruined, you know, the entire look of it. And um, this is just something that, you know, like this is like a 10 minute filter that we made. And um, you, there's a lot of personal creativity that goes into it as well. Yeah, so I exactly. think that, you know, maybe you won't own a set of 12 lenses, but it's a yeah. lot easier to own a set of 12 IOPs. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a short break. There's um, time to go use the restroom and get a coffee and all that. And then when we come back, we're going to show, you guys are going to be the first people in the world to see the ultra compact wide zoom, the full pack. So yeah, this is um, the first time this has been shown. Previously in the film era, um, Anjanu had the Optimo zooms, which is a 15 to 40 and a, a 28 to 76. These are like very very well-known common lenses to see everywhere. Beautiful lenses, super high performance. Those are super 35 lenses that were T28. These lenses have basically the identical field of view. A 28 to 76 translated to full frame would be a 37 to 102. And similarly, this, is, this wide lens is a 21 to 56. Now, those Super 35 lenses were T28. These are full-frame lenses that are T29. I mean, T, yeah, T29. So they've increased the coverage area by 100% and have only lost a tenth of a stop. So there's obviously some very, very high-level um, optical engineering going on. Do you want to put the image yeah, of the Steadicam up to the top there? Could we have that image of the city? Yeah. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah. All right. And if you guys want to kind of like move around and, and do your thing too. Um, so this is another part of uh, what makes, you know, Ingenue so amazing is their zoom lenses that aren't a sacrifice. They're so cinematic and beautiful. Um, that you know you can use them along with any prime, and they they don't draw any attention to themselves. In fact, they're just really desirable art making tools. Um, so these lenses have a what's called an interchangeable rear optic. They don't quite have the same flexibility as the IOP, but that's because there's so many moving parts and uh, the image crossover changes. Um, position so many times and uh, just the design of a zoom lens would make that impossible but they do have something called a IRO, it's an interchangeable rear optic and that allows you to go between a full frame coverage lens that's a T29 and a like a U35 
open gate Alexa 35 coverage lens that would be a T22. And they both would have the same field of view. Um, they would just cover different sensors. So 37 to 102 with that becomes a 28 to 76. This lens, a 25, 21 to 56, becomes a 16 to 42, slightly a little bit bigger than the 15 to 40, but that's because it covers not Academy film S35, it covers U35, which is the uh, Alexa 35 open gate format. So um, it's a very flexible lens and it's uh, just a really gorgeous lens. They've really changed, it's not like just taking a 28 to 76 and putting a like a you know magnifier on it. It's it's a completely redone lens that they have changed the way that the uh, barrels move and the way that the, everything is attached. It's a much stronger lens and um, it has this secret recipe that I was talking about in the beginning, which is the high resolution, low contrast, true color rendition. And like I said, you add the three of those things together, then you get the obvious result would be amazing skin tones. Um, and uh, very low distortion, there's no ramping, and uh, it's a nice compact lightweight tool. And you know, it's a 21 to 56 in full frame, it's a really nice size for an application like this. And um, we are... Uh, excited to launch this lens. So now we have the entire family. Now there's basically like uh, everything. You've got the ultra 12 by that covers your big A camera that's on the remote head or whatever. You've got the, the two zooms, the wide and the medium zoom, and then you've got the series of 12 primes that all match. So instead of just saying like, oh, what I want to shoot with the Ingenue Zoom, what primes match best with that? The new sort of obvious answer to that would be Optima Primes. And, you know, I mean, they, you can use them with IOP, but even without the IOP, they're, they're gorgeous lenses. Um, at this point, I have like a Q&A session, more yeah, or less, Now right? we're going to have the Q&A session. And then so in, once that's done, we can kind of go back to what we were doing just then, which is like shooting. So. And then, yeah, we will go that so yeah, let's get the microphones Tim, Tim please Smith, I think my, we have I two volunteers who are here to handle the microphones Tim Tim Smith okay he's in the back you guys have any questions raise your hand yeah um, okay go after him there you go hi thank you what's the main difference between the new zoom and the easy zooms you had like oh, a couple of question. years ago thanks yeah, so the easy zooms are were kind of designed, it's like an entry level zoom. It was designed to appeal to kind of like an owner operator market, something along the lines of what Ingenue had released before, which was like a, a DP Rouge or something. Um, it, the coatings of those lenses are Ingenue coatings, but the design, the, the build of that lens is that lens is built in Japan. And it's a, it's, Easies are probably like one of the most uh, successful products we've ever had. And it's an awesome lens, but if you need to be sh at a higher performance level, if you're going out to a big screen, if you're making a movie, if you're shooting special effects plates, all that stuff, it, the difference will be pretty obvious in between the two. They're the resolution from the center to the edge. The consistency is much higher on these zooms. The light fall off, the light performance is much more consistent. All of the very difficult tasks that you would have to achieve to create the ultimate zoom lens are, are much closer to being achieved in these lenses than in the EZs. Also, EZs are like not designed with the same level of mechanical ruggedness. These lenses are designed to like live on an arm car that's going on a sand dunes and you know, going 100 miles an hour, and the EZ is like not necessarily, it's, it's for an owner operator or something like that. These get pressed into use, and their EZs are on these huge features and stuff, but they're really not uh, designed to be like a lens that like is 
beaten to you know submission on like a big crude show in every different you know mount and and movement and environment you would put them in they they they're not designed to stand up to the stress of like a, a heavy like a heavy duty rental house lens so on one hand it's like they both make really nice pictures they both have that same guiding principle behind them i would say that the easy is like the di one of the other differences is that like this lens can be softer while at the same time being sharper yeah the, the, you know what i mean it's like almost like a like a zen riddle or something but like it has more of both in it. it has more softness and it has more sharpness but it's yeah. also massively differently built mechanically to just be like a, a race car also a major difference is the original look the original original look you have on the optimal range of lenses mm -hmm. the easy lenses have a cinematic look but it's not the exact original look that you used to see on this type of lenses we just presented mm -hmm. so that is one of the biggest different big differences yeah Sure, another question? Okay. Cool. Oh yeah, one, one there, yeah. okay. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering with the uh, zooms, do you have a rear net holder or filter ho holder on the rear mount of the... Uh, there's, uh, a, like a rem there's a threaded piece of glass there that's like a... It's not like a glued in piece of glass, it just comes out, so... Something like, and it, there is a, like a, a shroud that comes off, right? right. On the back? Right. Yeah, yeah. So there's a removable baffle and a threaded glass insert. I don't know if it's like designed for exactly that, but it would, would definitely work for that. Yeah, and you could just buy that as a part and glue a net on there and do the same thing we were talking about with the primes. But um, it might not be called that in the parts manual. Yeah. But it's there. Um, More questions? Another one over yeah. there. Thank you. So you are, you're not doing the three conversions like you are with the 12 by Ultra, the Correct. Super 35, Ultra 35, and 40. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's due to the kind of predominance of... of um, digital cinema and also kind of the uh, narrowing down of how much money we would have to spend to create another thing that was just Super 35 versus something that was U35 and would also work with Super 35. It's just kind of like a poll that we asked a lot of people about and, and like, would you mind if you know, we had two instead of three and... and, and a Can you of... also explain the difference between Super 35 and U35? Yeah, so Super 35 is um, like what you would have on an older Optimo or something where it's like the coverage basically goes to the edge of uh, a piece of Super 35 film. And I have to look at the ASC manual or like at my app or something to tell you exactly how many... Um, millimeters this is, but the U35 is like what you would have in a Alexa 35 shooting open gate. This will cover that. And, um, but like I said, it, it is a 16 to 42 that covers, in, in, the, in the U35 mode, it's a 16 to 42, and you could just put that onto a camera shooting Super 35 and it would be a 16 to 42. So instead of a 15 to 40, it's, you know, it's a little tiny bit this way and a little tiny bit that way. But it's, it is basically 23% uh, more coverage than Super 35 or something like that. You're more of an expert than I am, so. Yeah, I think it's like a little bit, it's like a 20-ish percent difference in coverage or 16 or something. But I'll, basically it's whatever the dimensions are of the Alexa 35. I think my jet lag is kind of getting to me here a little bit, but um, it'll cover that. And then, like I said, you can just put it onto a Super 35 camera and it will over cover that, but it will still be a 2-2, 16 to 42. Um, I had another question. Are yeah. you going to be planning on doing a third compact zoom in your set? 
the equivalent of a 45 to 120 in large format? I just had the same questions regarding the easy lenses. Um, basically, Angenau is always trying to have a range of lenses to create an ecosystem. This is what we just sh showed here. We have the ultra 12 times, the primes, and the two small zooms. So you're right, we had a 45 to 120 in the past. So of course, we are always trying to increase and to enlarge our range of lenses and make sure that we provide the best focal lengths possible for your activity. So I can tell you that now, there will be another lens, a third lens, uh, but I can just tell you that we're always brainstorming and always preparing the future with more lenses. So more lenses to come for sure. But I can tell you now, yes, we will have a 45 to 120. Say that again. Uh, same thing. We Again, we always try to increase our range of lenses. So we have two lenses for the easy at the moment. Who knows if we will make more in the short future. That is very possible. Uh, we are always contemplating the market and try to, you know, we, it takes us a, about a year to, to present a new lens at this point because we have very fast design processes uh, and simulations. We don't make prototypes anymore. Now we have simulation systems that allow us to go very fast, and uh, this is this yeah, lens is the example. This is, this so, is the generation uh, in which we stopped getting prototypes, and so we just get production lenses now, which is so really interesting. So we try to be as reactive as possible, and uh, for sure this range of lenses will keep increasing. More questions? Okay, so if you don't have more questions, I invite you to yeah. come back, back to, what to we the were set doing here. and play with the lenses, ask questions to Randy, Tell us what you would like to see. We can change. Please uh, have a look at uh, Arno's uh, demonstration. Arno, can you? Yeah, can we start Arno is the also, demo? he's going to show and you guys how. We will how show you how to dismantle, which is very interesting yeah. because, it's, uh, as we said, it's a very flexible system. Yeah, it's not terribly complicated. And in about 10, 15 minutes, you can swap uh, the IOP element to another one. So here he is. <laughs> Thank you, Arno. You guys, yeah, and also, I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, feel free to. Uh, yeah. Hang out. Right. And I, before, we, before we do that, I just want to thank very much the festival, Camer Image, yeah. for their amazing collaboration. We are pleased to have you here. And I would like to give the microphone to Christophe Romonté, uh, who is the managing director of the cinema activity at Angeneux, and he will just tell us a few words. Good afternoon. <laughs> So th thank you for being, us, uh, for being here with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, just uh, to confirm you, uh, uh, I hope, yeah, that you are, conf that you are uh, convinced now that uh, innovation is totally part of the DNA of uh, all lenses. And uh, every day that we are coming to the factory, this is to build and design lenses dedicated to our, uh, to our service and at the service of your creativity. So thank you for being here and see you soon. Yeah, it's true. When I started at Angenieux 35 years ago, um, I, I started with the Angenieux family and the Angenieux family left uh, for different reasons. But Bernard Angenieux told me when he left, he said, never forget one thing. This company is at the service of the cinema community. We're not here to do marketing, we are here to serve the cinematographers. So this is in our DNA and we never forget that. That's the reason why we did that today and we hope you enjoyed it. And last but not least, I want to thank very much Luisa and uh, Vera from Lava Films who have been extremely helpful. And again, Heliograph team uh, and the festival team who have helped us out to make this workshop. So please enjoy the lenses. Come to the set. Sorry, it's a bar. We don't have alcohol, but uh, join us. Thank you very much.